Well, welcome to Healing Insights from the Book of Psalms. I'm Dr. David DeRose. It's great to have you with us as we continue our journey looking at a book that I believe has powerful healing insights for all of us. So today we're going to continue our journey. I will be uh, your your guide tonight. We'll um, have uh, Brian Choi alongside me to, to help uh, with the dialogue as we continue to look at some really powerful healing messages. Let's begin with a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for just the privilege of opening up the book of Psalms. And as we've observed in the first couple of meetings that we've had together, this book is full of insights, full of powerful healing principles. We pray that you'd help us to connect with them in our study, that those who are uh, supposed to join us in real time, uh, if they're not already here, that they would be joining us soon. And uh, those who will be viewing these presentations after the fact that you would minister to them as well. So please guide us on this journey together. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as we begin tonight, I really want to um, focus on a, a dimension that a lot of us uh, may not be completely aware of. And that is uh, this, this whole dimension of healing as it relates to a book that has been, uh, well, often framed in different ways throughout history. So I want to invite you as we begin today, we're going to go to uh, to Psalm 1. We want to talk a little bit about the structure and a little bit of context too. So we've done things, uh, well, a little bit different in the two presentations. You know, first I gave you an overview and then Pastor Brian Choi led us uh, last week. And I really appreciated what Pastor Choi did. Some of you resonated with that. Others of you, uh, at least a few of you shared a little bit of frustration last week. And I want to make some comments about that. So what Brian was doing last night is what I think all of us should be doing every time we go to the scriptures. And that's, a, we, we call it an inductive Bible study, where you're actually really looking at the text and asking yourself what it means. And uh, some of you, like I said, you know, especially appreciated that last week. And some of you got with me and you said, well, uh, you know, it seemed kind of laborious and that we were going over things, didn't make a lot of headway. We weren't uh, you know, we're hearing different people's opinions. Um, so the message that I want to first give you is if you look at the very words in Psalm 1, I want you to see this because I, I felt what happened last week was really what we want to do on an individual basis, whether we do it on a group basis or not. And, and uh, that's what I'll mention here in a few moments. So I'm going to Psalm chapter 1. And we read through this psalm together last week, and I'm going to actually ask uh, Pastor Choi if he would just read through the psalm again, just so we're all on the same page. It's a short psalm. Brian, would you read for us uh, Psalm 1, verses 1 through 6, please? So remember, those of you that have been with us, we looked at how the psalms have a structure. There's five books to, to psalms. This is the first psalm in the first book, as well as the first psalm overall. And that first book of Psalms, especially paralleling uh, those five books of Psalms, you know, five collections of Psalms, if you want to think that think of it that way, or five volumes, paralleling the Pentateuch, the five books that Moses wrote. So there seems to be this connection, this connection between the Psalms and what's often known as the law or the law of Moses or the first five books of Moses. So here's how the Psalms and this first of these five books, these five volumes, of the psalm start. Okay. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. 
So first comment about this, uh, this psalm. So this is an introductory psalm. And if you look at the structure of the book of Psalms, what we observed is the first two volumes or the first two books of the Psalms, they actually conclude with Psalm 71 and 72. So if you look over there uh, with, to Psalm 72, I just want to remind you of something because uh, there's an interesting observation that we made, and it's especially relevant as we talk about Psalm 1 and 2 tonight. And Psalm 72, the closing words of Psalm 72 are found beginning with verse 18. Psalm 72, beginning with verse 18. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. And blessed be his gracious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And so this one theme of praise that we see, this reflecting on God's goodness, uh, comes throughout the book of Psalms. We, we talked about how this in itself is healing. But Psalm 72 then, verse 20, has these words, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So it seems originally when the Psalms were collected, the Psalms of David were first. Some of those Psalms were later put later in the 150 chapters of Psalms, but they're heavily dominating the first two volumes, the first two books of Psalms. And when we come to Psalm 1 and 2, what we find is that these are not Psalms that at least in the Psalter, in the book of Psalms, in the, the, this, these five books, they're not attributed to David explicitly. So we saw in contrast to that, Psalm 3 begins a Psalm of David. And if you look through Psalms 4 and 5 and onward, most of the initial Psalms are listed as a Psalm of David. So question for you. Why do you think in a book after these first two volumes, Psalm 72, we just saw, especially making reference to the Psalms of David, why do you think the authorship of David would not be made explicit in the first two Psalms? Any any thoughts about that? Yes, uh, I'll go ahead, Ursula. Okay, actually, I was reflecting on that, but I, I did not, <laughs> I came to learn from you because I could not, uh, I observed that, yes, Psalm 1 and 2 does not have uh, authorship or title of any kind. Okay. Stacy? Well, my first thought is God's word is universal and it's for everyone. And so, I don't know. <laughs> okay. It's just, well, just, you know, it's just my thought. So, so it, seem, it seems that it's, it's, these first two Psalms are made to be distinct, to stand apart from just identifying them as Psalms of David. And so many people, as they look at these Psalms and as we read through them, it seems like there's a deliberate intent to have these two Psalms stand as an introduction. Um, some commentators believe that these two Psalms might have originally been a single Psalm, uh, but the point is, these psalms serve as an introduction. Now, it's interesting, if you go to Acts chapter 4, because we're looking tonight at Psalm 1 and 2, and I, I'm trying to give you the, the big picture, the flyovers, and then we'll kind of drill down a little bit on some of the details. And I'm going to come back to the comments I made about inductive Bible study and what uh, Pastor Choi was helping, with, uh, helping us with last week, and, and why that's so vital on a personal level, uh, but why uh, sometimes, and I, and I I really liked the study last week, um, yeah, personally. Too. I know some other folks, they they shared with me that it was kind of frustrating to them. And and I relate to that too, because I, um, but I want I want you to see this through my eyes and why I think the whole process was of value, whether you really just kind of were drawn in last week or whether you kind of, kind of felt, well, um, a little bit uncomfortable. And I'll, and I'll comment on that in a minute, but I'm going to, to the book of Acts chapter four. And so this is the early church. They're gathered together in Acts chapter 4, and there's an interesting statement made in Acts 4 that we don't find in Psalm 2, but it is actually a quotation from the second Psalm. And uh, to fully appreciate that, we will have to read Psalm 2, but 
you'll have to trust me at, at this time if you haven't looked at Psalm 2 recently. But what they are doing here in Acts chapter 4 is beginning with verse 24 and 25. Here's what they say. These are, it does not identify it as who is praying here. Maybe we'll start with verse 23. So I'm in Acts 4, verse 23 and onward. Actually, why doesn't someone help us? If, if they would be so kind to read verses 23, it's kind of a long passage through verse 30. Acts 4, 23 through 30. I can, I guess, if am I unmuted. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're good, Stacey. Um, good. I've got the English Standard Version. Let's see. Okay. Okay. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who, th who through the mouth of our father, David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in the city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch, your, stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed. Through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Okay. And when they, oh, sorry. No, that's good. So okay. the verse 23 is referring to Peter and John. They'd been arrested, then they're released, and they come back in verse 24, and the believers gather together and, and they pray. And the prayer that's prayed in verse 25 refers to what was spoken by the mouth of David. And uh, what is being quoted there? Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? Turn back to Psalms. And I want you to see this. So Psalms, we just heard from Psalm 1. Now we're looking at Psalm 2. And then we'll uh, try to draw some of these lines of thought together here. In Psalm 2, how does Psalm 2 begin? Ursula, do you want to... Read for us uh, just verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 2. I'll be glad to. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain in sing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So, yeah, there you have it. The okay. kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the anointed one. That's perfect. So do you see what they're we're quoting from in Acts 4? In yeah. Acts 4, yeah. verse 25, where were they quoting from? Psalm one, uh, 2. Psalm 2. Psalm 2, exactly. And in verse 25, what did the early church say about the authorship of Psalm 2? David, King David. Yes. It was the Psalm of David. Name is mentioned. David, David spoke these words. So Psalm 1 and 2 don't have Davidic authorship associated with them. It seems that they're made to stand apart like as an overview. But um, there is a, a history where... It seems that David may well have been the author of the first two Psalms. And, um, and yet it's providing an overview that transcends the Psalms of David. So it's not just an overview of the Psalms that we read that are said to be a Psalm of David, but it's an overview of all the Psalms. So let's come back now to this point, this, um, this inductive Bible study method. So last week, what I really saw played out, what I loved about the study is we were talking about verse two. And 
And I thought Pastor Choi encapsulated that spirit because in verse two, he was illustrating as he led the dialogue, I felt what verse two in Psalm one is talking about. Uh -huh. It's talking about the godly person. His delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law, he meditates day and night. He 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 chews on the law. He he digests. He he uh, he reflects on the word of God, and um, and we were doing that collectively. I thought it was a, a very good illustration of 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 what it looks like to reflect on the law. What does this mean? And and so whether we do that as a group or not. And again, I, I know sometimes that can seem a bit laborious to people. Like you know, we spend so much time on three verses, but. I believe that's what that's what this is talking about, at least on a personal level. Psalm one is actually written to the individual. Right. You, you see, it's written, it's about individuals. It's blessed is the man, blessed is the person. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the blessed person who trusts in God, who reflects on his word. So the challenge I want to give you is, is, is however we we go with these series of studies, whether we do kind of that more very inductive type study where we're going word by word and asking people, you know, how they see it, or whether we do something that that I kind of gravitate a little more to, and I, I think Brian may as well, um, even though I appreciated so much that emphasis in our in his first uh, study that he led out with, is um, we want you to be doing that. As you go through the Psalms on your own, as you prepare to interact from week to week, that you take the time and say, what does this mean? Why are these words there? Why does it say, uh, why does it say a tree? And we spend a lot of time talking about the tree and planted by rivers of water. Why is that imagery so powerful? How, how does that relate to you? What, what, what about your experience? So again, we may not, it may not be the ideal venue to, to drill down that deeply and just hear people's, you know, different reflections. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think that process that was illustrated last week is really a, a valuable process as far as what we do individually. So I'm just, first of all, kind of interested in, in your take on that observation. Any of you? You mean like how we did it last week versus just reading Well, I'm it? just, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking about kind of, yeah, so the, I'm speaking about the concept. Does that, does that resonate with you? In other words, that, that when you study, um, let, let me put it this way, and so I appreciate you asking for clarification. The way my mind works in the society we're in, I'm a physician, okay? So I try to read things quickly. I mean, I'll I'll pull up a study. I'll try to quickly, you know, look at the summary statements. Is this something worth reading or digging into more deeply? So um, trying to uh, encompass as much information as quickly as possible. We're a very media-driven society. And again, yes. um, trying to give a lot of content very quickly. So what I find myself, I find myself sometimes struggling and looking at things more deeply and reflecting because you can look back and you can say, well, what did I do? What did I accomplish? And I just looked at a few verses. And yet I mm -hmm. think that this is um, what a lot of people have lost in the Christian world, they just fly through things yes. and they don't really look at the power of the word. Now, does that make sense to you? Does some of yeah. you relate to that? I can. Okay, so I hear a number I of yes. I don't yes. think, yeah. um, I guess, I think it, um, personally, uh, we're all from different areas, different backgrounds and um, some people may have more Bible knowledge and some not as much. So I think trying to uh, relate to everyone, so to speak, the the deeper digging is great, but it might be challenging for some if they're not used to that. And I, I, I'm kind of eclectic. I have all sorts of styles. I mean, I, I like doing that, but I like reading it and, discussing and um so i don't know i that's the only thing i could think is maybe if there's some that aren't as familiar it can be a little overwhelming yeah and i think pastor Choi and i are the same brian i don't know if you want to speak to, to that but i know you've done a lot of different 
styles of teaching and preaching and studying. Um, do you want to kind of weigh in? Because I've been kind of speaking for you. So I mean, okay. trying to commend you, but also letting folks know that there's different ways we can approach things. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think just uh, that one session we had last time was an example of, um, you know, one way of studying it. And so mm -hmm. I'm well aware of different methods to reach uh, different learners. I think every, many people are different learners. I used to be a teacher too. So I know that there's different learners and that people have different learning styles. And the great thing about the Bible is that it can be very flexible to those different various learning styles. And so that's something that um, I think that over time, we're going to kind of hopefully, you know, touch upon, you know, these various ways of exploring the Bible, exploring the text in a way that could be meaningful for anybody as they're studying. And so I appreciate the input. So Ursula, I know you want to weigh in, so help yeah. us out here. Yeah, I'm going to put my face away because I'm very conscientious about not being on a large screen. <laughs> so oh, okay, okay, that, fair enough. Okay, it was a beautiful introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear perfectly. me okay? Yes, perfectly. We could we could okay. hear you. That's important. That I found it was a very beautiful introduction to mm -hmm. how to study. Mm -hmm. And yeah. however, I was asking myself, how long of a commitment are we going to have mm -hmm. with each other? coming to some 100 uh, uh, a middle ground how we're going to proceed with that but i thought it was really very helpful to you know learn how to ponder and meditate and digest and delight into that first psalm as the basis introduction amen amen yeah thank you for making that point that and, no that that's beautiful helpful? that was very helpful and um, and I think that's that's what what I'm hoping that everyone did get from that. Um, and yet I don't think that that necessarily is perhaps the and I don't I think Pastor Choi would agree with this, too. I don't think that's I don't think we want to leave the impression that we're going to, to to use that method as we continue. We really want to model that. And uh, for you to as you dive into the to the word, ask God to show you and to reflect on these things. And uh, so we're going to be a little bit um, more rapid as we go through. Uh, we're going to try to finish Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 tonight. Um, Shirley, do you have a comment that you wanted to make? Or is it? Or are you just poised with pen in hand? No. I, I really wanted to say that it meant a lot to me last time, uh, even though I only got a little bit until I rewatched it. And it's that deep study is what I need because when somebody just goes and reads a whole chapter or something like that, I don't get too much out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would rather get a little bit something and feel like I'm being fed and learn how to study. It's been a long time since I was in college. 67 was a long time ago. Well, we're, 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 um, we're actually, so we're trying to strike a balance between things that kind of give you the big picture and, and uh, and integrate with the other uh, parts of the Bible, and also look at the individual Psalms in some detail. So to Ursula's question, like what kind of commitment is this? Um, there's actually no commitment, and so we encourage people to just jump on. You know, if you're free on a Tuesday night, if you've got other things going on, um, you don't have to feel like uh, like you're committed. Like you 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 know, some of you have been with us you know, this is episode three. Some of you have been with us for the first three episodes. And what we expect with something like this is that we're not going to have a consistent group because it's, um, we're reaching people across the country and and uh, potentially even beyond. And what's, what's happening over the next uh, month or two is there's going to be more publicity about this group. So some of you know, I host a weekly radio show. We're going to be inviting people who listen to the radio show to join. I have a weekly TV show. We're going to be telling people 
couple episodes of the weekly TV show about the opportunity to join. And I really see people coming on maybe for a single visit, see if they think it's something that they like to interact with. And we have people watching the videos after the fact. So some people may say, hey, well, that's interesting. Uh, Tuesday night at eight o'clock isn't a good time for me uh, or at 5 p.m. if they're out on the Pacific coast. And, um, you know, and I'm going to watch it after the fact. So we 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 are reliant on some people coming because it's designed to be a dialogue. But uh, not, no one should feel obligated to be here because uh, the Lord's going to take care of who we need to have here. And uh, both Brian and I, we're going to be pretty much, I don't want to say every other week, but uh, we're going to take turns facilitating. Um, for example, next week I'll be out of the country, so I won't be on at all, but but uh, Pastor Choi will be leading out. And um, and so the point is, I, some of you might say, well, I like Pastor Choi's style or Pastor Jerome, but we're trying to make, we're trying to make it more um, homogenous so that we don't like, People aren't saying, well, you know, is it going to be this person leading? Is it going to be? This? No, we, we kind of want it a little bit of consistency so you can kind of know what to expect when you jump on. So and I think, you know, Brian and I have been talking. So I think we're going to be, you know, going forward pretty, pretty much unitedly. So with that background now, I want to continue with Psalm 2 because we looked at Psalm 1, the first half, uh, again, looking at the individual and we're going to see in Psalm 2 is looking at community. So big, broad themes of Psalms. Psalms, I made the, the point that Psalms, the Psalms cannot be read and appreciated fully alone, that the Psalms were made to be read in community. And so if we're looking at Psalm 1 and 2 as an introduction to the book of Psalms, we're going to expect just what we're finding. That Psalms is going to speak to us individually. This is what Psalm 1 is about. It speaks to us individually. And Psalm 2 is going to speak to us corporately. So um, let's look at the um, final three verses. Pastor Choi had already read these. But it contrasts the righteous in the first part of the psalm with the wicked. And um, the imagery that's given in verse 3 the tree planted by waters, this majestic living tree that's thriving in the midst of the desert, connected to the living waters. The contrast is with verse four. What is chaff? And how is that different than a living tree? Who would like to, to tell me whether that illustration resonates with you? It's not the whole grain. Yeah, it's, it's not even the whole grain. It's not the whole grain. It's just a part that needs to be let go of. Okay. It's it's basically the waste, right, of the winnowing process. When you yes. when you uh, are refining the grain after you've harvested, you get rid of the chaff. And if you've um, ever seen people in uh, indigenous cultures uh, winnowing grain, you'll see uh -huh. the chaff flying away with uh -huh. the breeds. Um, so it's an image of impermanence, right? The tree is a vision of permanence. Um, does any of this escape the Lord? Verse six. six. He knows the way of the For righteous. The knows, he knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Is clear. Okay. So, so Psalm one is telling us that that God is over everything. He's watching over the righteous and the wicked, and the results of the righteous life is like a tree planted by rivers of water. The results of the wicked are like chaff. And it's interesting in verse 5, we highlighted this a couple of weeks ago, where the, the, the chaff doesn't stay, they're not in the congregation of the righteous. So the, the, those who are right with God are shown as being in community. And I think it's very interesting, um, very interesting how our society seems to be fracturing and uh -huh. people getting in their little camps and their little silos. And uh, people even, I was just, uh, someone was just talking with me about a church uh, many miles from where I am, but they said this huge thriving church uh, before COVID and uh, after COVID and everything, they said, it's like a ghost town. Um, yeah. So people have all 
Yeah, it is. It's very sad. People have have you know found kind of their their own personal worship, and they're not coming into the congregation of the righteous anymore. What about other observations on Psalm one, Brian? I know you um, spent quite a bit of time studying, and we didn't talk about all of it, but we want to draw some final points and then move to Psalm two. Any other insights, Pastor Choi, for us? Okay, so you're muted, Brian, right now. But I, what I, I took away clearly was that there is great delight and, and pleasure, definitely, um, life-giving pleasure to delight in the law of, the, of God and to meditate on his love and precepts and to get to know him spend time to get to know god amen no that's great L let me show you now big picture okay psalm one is the first psalm in the first volume or the first of these five books of the psalms i want you to fast forward to the middle volume and that it begins with psalm 73 and Psalm 73, we're not going to spend much time with it. I just want you to see this by, by way of the structure of the book of Psalms. So these are not, what I'm just trying to help you see is these are not just random poems that were just thrown together in a random order. Psalm 73 directly parallels Psalm 1. So okay. Psalm 1 is speaking about the blessing of the person who works with walks with God and the curse of the person who doesn't. And so when the third volume of the Psalms opens up, what's called the third book of the Psalms, and I know it's a confusing terminology. Mm -hmm. You think, well, aren't isn't every chapter like a a book? Well, no, not really. But anyway, it's it's still. I think it's a little bit confusing. So Psalm seventy three, <laughs> fascinating Psalm, and just just look at two verses. Psalm seventy three starts out very much like the 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 way Psalm one ends. Mm -hmm. Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Mm -hmm. But then Psalm 73 says, hey, but this isn't how things really are. As for me, my feet almost stumbled. Verse 3, I was envious of the boastful. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So in Psalm 1, we read that the wicked don't prosper. But when we get to this parallel first Psalm of Book 3 of the Psalms, Volume 3 of the Psalms, the psalmist, Asaph, identified as the psalmist, is saying, but it doesn't look like Psalm 1. And if you read through verse, verses 1 through 16, it's like, this is not Psalm 1 playing out. But then we get to verse 17, and Asaph says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. So the sanctuary, God's throne room, kind of answers the questions. And the, the sanctuary is all involved with, with judgment and righteousness and God's forgiveness. And uh, there's great themes in the sanctuary that the Psalms actually will engage us with as we go through the Psalms. But I want you to see that, that, that there's some, some recurring themes and even the structure of Psalms draws us into these themes. So with that background, Psalm 2. Because Psalm 2 develops much like Psalm 73. So at the beginning of the overview of Psalms, we see this depiction. The righteous are blessed like trees, hardy trees. The wicked curse, they're like chaff. But now we come to Psalm 2, and we see that the wicked in community are banding together and uh, let's actually read through the psalm. So um, would someone be willing, we'll, we'll take it in uh, in groups of verses. Would someone read for us Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3? If you want me to, I, I can. Why do the nations rage and the people blot? The vain sing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces 
and cast away their courts from us. Okay, and because it's a short psalm, let's read through it. Let someone else read verses four through six now. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold him in his derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them with his deep displeasure. Yes, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with an iron rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Okay. Would someone read for us then verses 10 through 12? I can't. If it, it's a new living translation. Um Okay. Now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son, or he will become angry, and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities. For his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. Hallelujah. Okay. So we just read through Psalm 2. And um, clearly, right, we're looking at a psalm that's speaking to nations, speaking to groups of people, whereas Psalm 1 was speaking to individuals. And um, this is a very this is a very interesting psalm because it's speaking about a rebellion, if you will, against, in verse 2, the Lord and his anointed. So do any of you know who was anointed in the uh, in the Old Testament? The Messiah means to anoint, doesn't it? It's true. So the word um, for anointed is Mashiach. Um, pardon my Hebrew, but it's uh, it does mean the Messiah. The Messiah means the anointed one. Um, if you christen someone, the, the Christ is the Greek term for anointing. So, um, so yes, it, it does have, it has this connotation. When we hear Messiah, we think of Jesus, of course, but there were others so who were in. This is not talking about. Well, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Is this, so uh, okay. okay. Who else was anointed? David. David was anointed. Solomon was Saul. anointed. Every king. Yeah, Saul, every king was anointed. Prophets were anointed. They were sacredly set apart. So when you when you start reading through Psalm 2, when you read verses 1 and 2, um, the nations raging, the people plotting, the kings of the earth uh, conspiring, the rulers taking counsel together against who? The Lord and against his anointed, yes. saying, and let us bring... In, in, in the King, New King James Version, the anointed, that's why I was thinking of Jesus, is written in capital A. Yes, yes. That, that is an interpretation, okay? But okay. It, I believe it's a correct one. Um, but let me give you an illustration here. I'm going to jump to a different place in the Bible, and I want you to see what sometimes happens. So this is, you can't read through this psalm, and if you read through it, you're saying, now, wait a minute. Um you get to the point where saying this can't just be talking about an earthly king, and we'll we'll make that case as we go along. But I, I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 14. I want you to see an interesting parallel. There's another story of rebellion in the Bible. Um, it is one of them. There, there's some amazing chapters in the Bible, and I believe they parallel Psalm 2 in their underlying theme. So Isaiah chapter 14. And remember, we're trying to look at healing insights. And to me, one of the healing insights, and this may sound like a, a strange insight, but it's that the Bible gives us a picture of a world that is in conflict. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why would that be healing? It's because when I deal with patients who have illness, uh, the worse the illness, the greater the likelihood, and I'm just going to tell you, be it frank with you, the greater the likelihood is that people blame the person for the illness. Mm -hmm. They might say, no, people wouldn't do that. 
Um, I don't know if you've if ever thought about this, but we have a, a, a defense mechanism mentally. We, we don't want to think we live in a bad world where random things happen. If I can blame a victim for what happened, then, then it protects me psychologically. So if someone has a car accident and, um, and someone says, well, they were hit by a drunk driver, if they're hit, they're, they're in a car accident, I say, well, it's probably their fault. I may sit, say that on a mental level. Um, then someone says, well, they were hit by a drunk driver. And then I might say, well, they were probably not watching carefully. You know, they, they were probably, uh, and no, they, you know, they were very alert driving, uh, but the person just drove across the yellow line and, and crashed into them head on. And then I might say, well, they shouldn't have been driving at that hour. Well, it was 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, but the, the, the point I'm making is if, if we can blame people, and, and I see this as a physician, um, cancer is kind of a classic one, you know, where someone has cancer and then people try to blame them. Uh, because if I can blame someone like, well, they were probably smoking or they weren't taking care of themselves or because you don't want that thing to happen to you. So you say, well, what does that have to do with all this? The Bible says that, no, not everything that happens to you is because of your choices. We're in a battleground, okay? There, there's there's forces that are <laughs> fighting against each other, and sometimes we're caught in the crossfire. And, um, and so to me, it's actually a healing perspective to realize that I don't have to, yes, we, we all make choices and it contributes to our mental health or physical health. And we're trying to help you make good choices on this journey together. But um, don't fall into the trap of blaming yourself if you're dealing with, with problems. God offers forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of the themes of Psalm. But Amen. Isaiah 14 now. Isaiah 14 starts out with a prophecy. It's explicit. Verse 4 who is Isaiah 14, the prophecy of Isaiah 14? Who is it especially directed against? According to Isaiah 14, verse 4. The king of Babylon. That's right, the king of Babylon. And so as you start reading through this, you'll see it's speaking in verse 4 about the golden city has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked. Babylon was Wait opposed to God's people, right? Do you see, you see some of that there? And you can read through as you go through the, the chapter, though, as you start reading further and further, you get to verse 12 and you say, wait, 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 wait. What does verse 12 say? Who has Isaiah 14, verse 12? How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? So it's talking yes. about Lucifer. It's talking about Lucifer now, but it's it's speaking to the king of Babylon. So it goes from speaking about an earthly king to expanding to a cosmic dimension. And now it's speaking about Lucifer. I want you to notice something interesting. Verse 13, you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights. Do you see what's going on here? Mm -hmm. But this is clearly not just speaking about a king of Babylon. It's speaking about Lucifer in heaven. And this in uh, the place where rebellion started. Now, keep you don't have to keep your finger there, but go to Ezekiel 28. And what, I, what I'm trying to help us see is what we're introduced to in Psalm 2 is a grand theme in the Bible. Some people call it the great controversy. Um, where, where basically Satan and those that follow him are trying to overthrow God, um, ultimately overthrow God from the throne, but also uh -huh. throw, overthrow those who God has put in leadership. So Ezekiel chapter 28. And Ezekiel 28 starts out again explicitly with a prophecy uh -huh. against an earthly ruler. Who's the earthly ruler that is being focused on in Ezekiel 28? It's, it's yeah, the prince, of, the prince of Tyre, that's right. Yeah. Tyre was a um, an island nation that was um, just north of, uh -huh. uh, it would be in Lebanon today, 
the, the island of Tyre has become actually part of the, the mainland. Uh, some of you know the history. Um, Alexander the Great conquered this island by building a causeway to it. And uh, anyway, so so Tyre, uh, the king of Tyre was basically kind of an, an embodiment of this rebellion against God and uh, rebellion against uh, God's order. But as you continue to read through this chapter, it starts by speaking about the king of Tyre, who you can see in verse two, he was acting like he was God and and he was uh, speaking against the God of heaven. But as you get down to verse 12, again, the picture changes. And it's not just the earthly king of Tyre. It starts speaking about someone who in verse 12 of Ezekiel 28 was the seal of perfection, who mm -hmm. was in Eden, the garden of God. Well, there was king of Tyre wasn't in, the, in Eden. And as you read through it, verse 14, he was the anointed cherub. Right. This is speaking again about Satan. Yeah. Satan's rebellion in heaven, how he tried to exalt himself over uh, above God. So if you want to get an understanding of, of Satan's origins, read Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. But it's those prophecies, those pictures of who Satan was and how this great controversy started are couched in a human context of an earthly ruler. So go back to Psalm 2 with that in mind. So I'd like to suggest to you, many believe that Psalm 2 was written by David at the time of the coronation of Solomon. And so it definitely starts out, and you could read it, verses 1 through 3, that it's speaking about Solomon. David and Solomon are ruling. Solomon rules over the, the kingdom of Israel when it had its greatest extent, its greatest prosperity. And there were many nations that were subject to Solomon. And so the nations... Are, are depicted as raging against the king, the one who's anointed by God. They want to overthrow Solomon, but as Ursula pointed out, this anointed has a double meaning. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it refers clearly not only to Solomon, because as we saw in Acts 4, the early church applies this psalm to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So here's the drama. Look at this. I want to hear your, your feedback on this and tell me if, the, if you see this today. Then it, it, The psalmist is asking a question in verse 1. Why are the nations raging? Why are they, in verse 2, in verse 3, why are they rebelling against the king of heaven? What is the reason given for why the nations rebel against, in the cosmic setting, God? Why do, why do nations or groups of people rebel against God? Short answer is self. Okay. So just like we saw in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, they, they want there's about their self. They want to be in charge. Um, look at verse three. And and what are they complaining about, if you will? Slavery. Yeah, slavery. Like they're in bondage. And I would say this is the greatest misconception of the God of the Bible. Um, and I would say this is um, this is Satan, one of Satan's greatest lies. If God is interested in taking joy out of your life. He's interested in making you miserable, giving you a bunch of rules to follow. And by the way, many churches over the centuries have done a great job of making it look like that's what God's agenda is. But but God is not interested in taking joy out of our lives. Um, we we mentioned this verse in our overview. I just want you to look there. Uh, again, big picture verse, Psalm 16. Turn there real quickly. Because again, the Psalms, the Psalms have an underlying unity. The themes of the Psalms build on each other. So as we go through the Psalms, these things will connect. But as we're you know, reading Psalms 1 and 2, uh, it's a little bit more challenging to ca catch the fabric. But look at Psalm 16, verse 11. This is speaking of the kind of God that is revealed in the book of Psalms. Who would like to read Psalm 1611, what God's motive is for us? You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. Amen. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Such a favorite promise, no? Isn't that a beautiful verse? 
Amen. Amen. So it is is God. So go back to Psalm two. So the nations are saying we're not going to follow God because we want to break kind of His onerous bonds. You know, He's He's putting us in bondage. Is um, is that what God's interested in? No, 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 no. His His interest is the salvation of all. That's right. He, he's interested in blessing and ministering and healing. And we see it in Jesus. If there's any question, we see it in Jesus, right? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So God's response in verses four through six, what is God's response to those who are trying to, saying they're going to overthrow God? He laughs. Actually. He laughs. Mm -hmm. now, some, now, some people say, well, that doesn't sound like really nice. You know, God laughing. Um, no. Sometimes it's funny, the things people do. <laughs> uh, let me ask you a question. If, um, yeah. if you were maybe caring for a grandchild or a child or maybe helping out in a daycare and a church, a Sunday school or Sabbath school, and uh, you had to kind of keep a four-year-old in line and uh, kind of say, no, you need to sit down. And, you know, and that four-year-old got mad that you were telling him that. And he said, mommy gave me some spaghetti and I'm going to just hit you with this spaghetti and break your leg. Um, what would you think? Would you be tempted to laugh? Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's kind of sad, right? You're, you're not happy that he's um, threatening you, but you're like, like, this is such a joke. You know, like yeah. you're going to hurt me with your spaghetti? Um, yeah. And maybe it's a poor illustration, but it's like, it's not that God is 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 laughing like Stacy suggested, you know, that this is is but but it's just so foolish to think that the, mm -hmm. the humans well, but God he, but God he also says in Sephaniah, I shall sing over you with yes, with yes. So, I mean God obviously has <laughs> um, has emotions. Yes, God does have emotions. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you reminding us of mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And so God's answer, though, it says in verse six, he set his king on his holy hill of Zion. Remember in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, that the enemies of God are trying to overtake God out of his position. That's what Satan was trying to do. They wanted to be in God's position. And God's saying, I've set up my king. Now, this is true for David. It's true of Solomon, but it's true of Jesus. And verses seven through nine speak about mm -hmm. God saying, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, this is a very interesting verse. And I want you to go to Acts 13. I want you to see something very important about how under inspiration, the Apostle Paul applied this verse. There are two Antiochs in the New Testament. There's um, an Antioch in uh, Syria. And there's an Antioch in what would be modern-day Turkey. In Acts 13, Paul is in modern-day Turkey, Antioch of Pisidia or Pisidian Antioch. Mm -hmm. He's preaching. And I want you to see something very interesting. I, excuse me, Acts 13, verse 33. I'm reading from the New King James Version. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Amen. So Psalm 2 is being applied. You are my son, today I have begotten you. According to Acts 13, when was Jesus begotten? When he was raised from the when dead. When he was raised, yeah. That's right. When he was raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which, G so what? how you say, but wait a minute, I thought begotten meant born. See, some people take Acts 2 and they want to say, oh, well, this means Jesus didn't exist at one time. Uh, you know, he was, he, well, he, he, 
but the Bible is very clear, and we, we we don't have time to look at the verses tonight, but the Bible is very clear in John 1 and Colossians 1 that Jesus was the agent of all creation. The Bible says nothing was made um, without him. Okay, mm -hmm. so Jesus is the active agent of all creation. So Jesus was not, there wasn't a time when he didn't exist. But this idea of being begotten is being raised into a new position. So the king is the king starts a new life. He becomes his his regal life. His kingship begins at his anointing. So Jesus, in a special way, he's he's raised to the throne of God after his resurrection. He's um he's triumphs over his foes. His kingdom is is insured. Um, he's this term begotten is used in the context of the resurrection. So I think it's just interesting to point that out in Psalm 2. One other observation with Psalm 2, and uh, uh, and then we'll hear from you if you've got some other, a few other comments. Um, Psalm 2 ends with um, the fact that, that God is warning the nations not to rebel against his rule. If, it, if need be, verse 9, um, Jesus, when he sets up his final rule, he will break all the nations that have opposed him. And, um, and so the psalm ends with saying, learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. Verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now, that's a kind of an interesting uh, mm -hmm. combination there. Um, Kiss the son, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way. This isn't saying you know, we have to love Jesus or he's going to beat us up. But it's this idea of it's speaking to those in rebellion. It's talking about uh, in antiquity, yeah. you would kiss the conquering general. You would show your allegiance, the, the conquering king. Um, so showing that you're surrendering to this king. And it ends with these words, blessed, happy are all those who put their trust in him. So right. Psalm 1 starts out, blessed are those who don't follow the ungodly. Blessed are the ungodly when they repent. And um, and it's a message for individuals and community in Psalms 1 and 2 that sets the stage for the whole book. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. any other reflections on Psalm, on Psalm 2 as we, as we wind up tonight? Brian, have you got your, um, your system again interacting? Give us because you're going to lead us into Psalm 3 next week. Any final things you'd like us to take away from these first two psalms? Yeah, I, I really appreciate you bringing out the connection between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Um, and if you actually trace back to the first, I think it was verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 1, it talks about uh, the... Uh, talks about those who are ungodly give counsel to the, un the ungodly giving counsel the sinner standing in the way and also talks about the the those sitting in the seat of the scornful mm -hmm. and so you're talking about how you know they're actually in chapter two working together among themselves um and there's a community or fellowship of the ungodly that is actually kind of spoken of in the first chapter, uh, sitting in the seat of the scoffers. They're sitting together, scoffing, mocking anything that is, you know, holy or just or good from God. And in chapter two, you see straight out where they're actually conspiring against not only God, but his anointed as well. And so um, it's kind of like a nice little, you know, magnification uh, of what was kind of mentioned earlier as a little preview in chapter one but you see it manifested fully in chapter two and how god is going to be you know overall even mm -hmm. despite their planning and scheming god's going to reign over all things above their plans thank you brian brian would you lead us uh, as we have a, a closing uh, prayer as we conclude our uh, our study Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that we were able to delve into both Psalms 1 and 2. Uh, a lot of insights here of who you are in our relation to you, as well as how we can also see 
your will um, being reigning supreme over all things. And so, Lord, we know that your ways are higher than our ways, your thoughts and our thoughts. Help us to put our trust in you, uh, no matter what we go through, knowing that you are ultimately in control of all things. And we could put our trust in you. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, have a good evening. That's the end of our recording tonight. And we'll uh, take some individual time for reflections and for prayer at this point.